Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Kingsway. Super glad you're here with us today. If you're visiting with us, like uh, Kyle shared, we had somebody last service. Welcome. Welcome to Kingsway. And if you're watching at home, welcome. You guys all came back after last week. If you don't know what that means, it's because we're following a book called Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. The guy named Solomon, uh, he was king over Israel for a while, David's son, King David's son, and he wrote a thousand of five love songs. And uh, this is the only one that we know of that made it into the Bible. It was his favorite one. And uh, what I can tell you is it's following a couple about their kind of love, falling in love and dating and courtship phase to where they get married. Last week, they consummated the marriage. And then today, we're going to move on with the rest of their marriage. And as I told you last week, I got married just over 24 years ago to my lovely bride, Rachel Renee Mobley at the time. Yes, thank you, clapping for my wife. Now, Rachel Renee Nickison. Uh, I'll get that right some, one of these days. And uh, anyway, so what happened is we, we, I got a call from a church in Colorado. And we were only dating. We were like seriously dating, but we were not engaged. And this church in Colorado asked me to come out and be an intern. And I thought, well, I don't know what else I'm going to do in 30 days when I graduate. So... Sure, let's go to Colorado, it'd be awesome. And so I said yes to the job, but then I said, I was like, wow, I, the only problem is like, I'm dating this girl and I wanna marry her. I didn't, you know, I didn't know if I was ready to get married yet. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I was concerned. We didn't have all the technology stuff we have today. I was like, if I go to Colorado without her, and we may not make it. So I want her to go with me. So I asked her to marry me. She said yes, in case you weren't sure how it worked out. And then um, basically here's what happened. So over the next three months, we planned a wedding. I finished up my job that I was doing, this part-time job. We went on a honeymoon. We came back. We packed up everything we owned, which was not much, but enough to fit in the smallest U-Haul that you could rent. We drove across the country. When we got to Colorado, turns out we did not have an apartment like they told us we would. We were going to have to live with a family we'd never met and uh, live in their basement. And they had two young kids who loved to come down and hang out with us on a regular basis and uh, start a new job. And then about 30 or so days into my internship, this apartment that we were supposed to have opened up. And so then we had to repack everything up that was, I think, in a storage unit or garage or whatever. I don't remember the details. And then we had to go move that into our apartment and set everything up. And so you can imagine, at some point shortly after that, we took a stress test. You ever do those stress tests where it's like, do you have this kind of thing going on in your life? Have you moved? Have you gotten married? Have you had a change of jobs? Have you moved again? You know, it's like, we would do this list and then they ranked it. And like, out of a score of like 1,000, I think we had like 800 plus points on the scale. You only need to be like 300 to be stressed. And I wondered why we were so stressed. But all that stress was leading to a lot of bickering. Does any other married couple know what I'm saying? Please raise your hand if your spouse has a problem with bickering. I'm kidding. Do not stop that. <laughs> Have you learned nothing in this series? <laughs> so she and I were bickering and bickering and bickering. And I've told the story before, but I remember after church one Sunday, uh, we would just loaded the dishes in the dishwasher in this tiny little apartment kitchen, and uh, I was mad. And so I took the dishwasher door, and I slammed it shut, and I looked at her, and I said, so what are you saying? You want a divorce? And uh, I learned an important lesson that day. The D word is not allowed on the table, period. My wife looked at me with this look of shock and fear and hurt and said, what are you talking about? We're fighting. I said for the rest of our lives that I was gonna be married to you. I may kill you, but I'm just kidding. She didn't actually say that. <laughs> she didn't actually say that. <laughs> she felt it. She felt it, no. But here's the thing. Every marriage at some point is gonna have its issues. You're gonna have your issues. And we're gonna see that in this couple today. So where we left off last week was in chapter five, verse one. And what happened in chapter five, verse one is the couple has just... Uh, um, been intimate. I'm trying to be vague. That was last week's sermon, and you can go listen to it. And then God looks down in chapter 5, verse 1, and he celebrates their union. So now we pick up in verse 2, and we are now further into the marriage. We don't know how far, but here's what it says. Chapter 5, verse 2. I slept, but my heart was awake. This is her talking. Listen, my beloved is knocking. And here's what he says. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. And somebody told me, don't use the creepy voice. Stop, <laughs> stop using the creepy voice. So this is a quote from Solomon. This is from her. It's fascinating. Again, I told you, she speaks first, she speaks last. 
she speaks most. The night of their uh, honeymoon, he does most of the speaking as he's just celebrating the beauty of what he sees. But now she's going to do most of the speaking. And I, I, I'm not making a joke. It, it shouldn't surprise us that she's the one communicating a lot of the things. So what we're seeing here is uh, if you've ever been to the Middle East, which probably very few of you have, you would know that that is what's known as a Mediterranean climate. Uh, a Mediterranean climate, only I think roughly 3% of the entire world is a Mediterranean climate. California, though, is one of those 3%. And so if you really want to get a feel for what the Middle East is like, just go to California. It's a lot cheaper. And when you get over there, you'll find they have something called night clouds. I think that's what they call them. And what happens is because there's not a lot of rain, and yet it can be very green when it's not crazy dry like we've seen in California lately. It can be green, and the reason is because these night clouds bring dew. And so we're getting a little clue in the story as to what's happening here. Notice he says to her, my head is drenched with dew. That means he's coming in after midnight. It's late. And he wants to be with her. My hair is, was with the dampness of the night. So we know that, we don't know if this song, this song is about Solomon or if he's writing it generically about some other person, but, but Solomon had long hair, and, and we see a reference in here, so it's quite possible he's describing himself. The whole idea here, though, behind this, don't get lost in what's happening, is uh, women and men in those days slept in different places. Not necessarily different rooms, although sometimes most people didn't have a house with many, many rooms. They at least slept in different locations. And he has come in to be with his wife, to intimately connect with her. And when he comes to the door, she's already in bed. And what we're seeing is they're about to have their first fight. She had thoughts and ideas about how things were going to go. He had thoughts and ideas about how things were going to go. And those two things did not line up. She waited for him. She wanted to be with him. She wanted to connect with him. But he was busy working. Now, I realize in America today, many homes have uh, two working person homes. So what we're experiencing today, and you may not know this, what we're experiencing today is many women are saying the things that many men said for the last couple hundred years when you had more stay-at-home wives or stay-at-home moms. And so consequently, you have many women saying, well, I've got this work thing and these responsibilities, these other things I have to do, or whatever is going on. But I want you to picture a day, and I'm not saying one is good or bad or better than the other. It's irrelevant. What I'm saying is I want you to get a picture for their story so then you can insert yourself into their story. So she slept, but her heart was awake. She finally gave up and went to bed. I was sleeping, but really internally, I wanted to be with Solomon. And so when she hears him knocking at the door, hey, baby, you awake in there? When she hears him, she, she listens, but she does not respond. We'll get to that in just a minute. But notice his, uh, what he says to her. Some of this is drawing back on stuff he said before. You know, he calls her darling, my sister, which don't get weirded out if you're visiting with us. It's just familial language. Like he feels very connected to her. They're family now. My dove is a new one, if I'm not mistaken, but my flawless one, I mean, that was the key. Last week, when we looked at the night of their intimacy, remember, he looked at her, he's like, you are flawless. I mean, he's like, baby, if sister and darling didn't open this door, flawless one. That was the one. That's what made it work. And not so much, though. She's angry. So, okay, real quick. <clears throat> How do you deal with failed expectations in your marriage? Did anybody get married and find out things weren't going to go exactly like you thought they would? Or perhaps when you got married, you found out that maybe that person uh, really worked hard before you got married to win your affection and attention, but now that you are married, a little bit less so. I, I'm definitely not an expert in men, but I'm even less of an expert in women. But I can say this from many conversations pastorally over the years. Uh, men in general, big generality. So if you're different than this, feel free um, to email Brett. But uh, <laughs> men in general, men in general, we tend to be focused on various tasks. And once we've accomplished that task, we move on to the next task. That's not always true, but it tends to be very true. And many men struggle, therefore, once they've uh, won their wives and wooed their wives, they don't put in the same effort they used to put in. As consequently, many women feel like they are not as important as they once were. And it might be your hobby or your job or your commitments or your clubs or your social settings or really good things like coaching your kids' sports teams, but there's only so much of you to go around, and she didn't make the cut. In fact, her response to verse 3, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? Translation, I have a headache. Not <laughs> happening. I'm already in bed. 
I've already washed my feet. Must I soil them again? I mean, you can imagine an environment with, say, a dirt floor or whatever it is. You want me to get up and be all ready to respond to you? You want me to be all sexy or intimate or whatever it is? Like, come on, buddy. Where were you a few hours ago when I was waiting up for you? I wasn't real important then, was I? I mean, every, every married couple who's going to be honest can tell you they can relate with the sentiments of these verses, and that's why I love God's word. It's so real for everyday life. Well, years ago when my wife were trying to figure things out, somebody in our church came to us and said, hey, there's this thing called the Weekend to Remember. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, Weekend to Remember is put on by a ministry. I believe they're called Family Life. And, <clears throat> and uh, Family Life, they, they, they host these weekends. It's kind of like how to rekindle and build your marriage. And they put together different pieces. And one of the, those weekends was often hosted in Estes Park, Colorado, which was only about 30 minutes away from where we lived. So somebody helped us, I think paid for the hotel and whatever, we just had to get up there, somebody paid for the registration fee, and we went up and had a great weekend. I gotta be honest, I don't remember a ton about the weekend, I don't. I remember at least one conversation that we had that I would not share publicly, it was between my wife and I. I remember one of the events that we took part in, and, and I do remember coming away with an important lesson I'll share with you later. But what I did is uh, I decided to reach out to some other couples in our church who've been to the weekend, remember, and just ask them for feedback. Like, have you've been, I know you've been, somebody told me you've been, so can you just give me your thoughts? And one of the couples to respond uh, was Rob and Christy. And here was Christy's comments about Weekend to Remember. She said this, the Weekend to Remember conference has a built-in date night. It's a time on the second night that is set aside just for you and your spouse to have together. And you're even given a two-sided card with, a question, with questions on it. Rob had called ahead and made reservations at an Italian restaurant, and we sat and ate, talked about each session, and discussed the questions on the card. We didn't check our phones or talk shop, i.e. household stuff, kid stuff, work stuff. Honestly, without the couple's check-in card, I don't know if we would have been so intentional and deliberate with our dinner conversation. As I'm typing this, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that after 20 years of marriage, at that point, I needed a list of questions and topics to connect with my husband. But wow, how incredible our God is in his faithfulness and provision because I remember just looking into Rob's eyes, hearing his words and feeling his feelings and not just what I thought he was thinking and feeling. Ladies, did you catch that? Not just to assume you know, but to actually sit and listen. She goes on. After so many years of marriage, it's true that we know our spouse enough to say, oh, he would want this, or he thinks that, or even I'll do this because he'll do that. Make sense? But this date night experience reminded me of the Rob that I fell in love with in our early 20s, the fun Rob, the Rob with beautiful eyes and a sensitive soul. Hmm. Sometimes you just have to pause and get away and reflect and listen and connect, and put all the other responsibilities aside. I'm telling you, I feel like a hypocrite even as I say this, because I don't do it well. I'm not sitting here as an expert in this. I'm sitting here as somebody who struggles with this, but I know and value the importance of it. Rob responded. His response was shorter, but Rob said, this conference reminded me to slow down. It helped remind me that I may know my wife, but I need to hear her and see her. Guys, are you listening? It made me reconnect and recommit to things I kind of go through the motions daily with. The timing of this experience for me couldn't have come at a better time. We forgot about us, and I needed to find that part of us again. It's so real. <laughs> it's like what we all face. It's like what we all deal with on a regular, regular basis. All right, so... If you are interested in, in learning more about the Weekend to Remember, um, out at our event hub, at the end of the service, we have people there, and a lot of people went and got information. We had really good interaction. We actually have six couples worth of tickets, so 12 total tickets for free that we can give away. I thought about turning them into like paper airplanes and just zoom them out and see what happens. But, you know, if you and somebody else caught one, it was going to be weird. So what we decided was... <laughs> we were going to do a giveaway. And so over the next few weeks, if you would simply text the word marriage to 
4911, 317-565-4911. Just text the word marriage, and uh, you can enter into the drawing. We'll ask you some simple questions like, you know, how could we better bless you, resource you, help you, that kind of thing. And I just want to encourage you to, to do that at any point, and you may win one of those tickets to go to a conference. You have to pay for your own hotel or travel. There's one locally here in Indianapolis next spring. I can't remember if it's April or May, but there's, they're, they're happening all the time all across the United States, and I can't say enough good things about it. Also, out at our event hub, this is not just an announcement, but we are trying to find ways to resource you, to help you. Uh, the same ministry puts together something called a date night box. And the date night box is just a box put together for you to be able to have an intentional date night together. And uh, so we asked some couples in our church to go through it together, and, and one of them was Josh and Becca, who I quoted earlier in the series. And they went out and said they had a fantastic night. It really helped to have the box to kind of guide them through a date. And one of the best things to come out of that actually was a, a devotional and that they were able to start working through as a couple. And again, you can and you can get some more information about the date night box there. You can buy them online, but you can go buy the event hub afterwards. Just know, please, that we're a church that, that realizes what's happening on Sunday morning is important because it often plants the seeds. But what God wants to do is to grow a tree inside you that's going to produce fruit. And that often takes more resources, whether it's books or ministries or conferences or small groups or sometimes pastoral counseling to come alongside you. But whatever you do, don't give up just because it's hard. Notice what she says next, chapter five, verse four. My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolts. So part of what we see here is finally she has a change of heart. She's laying there, no, I am not getting out of this bed and I'm not coming over there. Then suddenly he reaches his hand through the door. One uh, lady after the service who was telling me about a funny fight that she was having recently with her spouse, she goes, I would have slammed the hand on his door. Well, <laughs> just to be clear, the door is shut, but he reaches through and tries to open the door. And all of a sudden, her heart changes. She longs to be with him, so she gets up out of the bed, and when she gets to the door, she finds the door handle dripping with myrrh which is such a weird thing for us. But what that means is Solomon had myrrh on his hand, and when he reached in to, to undo it, and what that tells us is myrrh has come up multiple times in the book, if you go back and look, and it's always a sign of their love and affection for each other. And so what we're learning is Solomon is really wanting to come in and be with, connect with, be intimate with his wife, but he worked late. And so he's late, and she gave up, and she went to bed, but she really wants to be with him too. She really wants to give herself to him. Him. Now, he's got a choice in this moment. He could be angry and say, woman, do you have any idea how hard I work to serve you and this family? Instead, he gently reaches his hand inside and he leaves myrrh on the door. It's a sign of his love and affection and his patience and his grace with her. It's a sign of his tenderness toward her so that when she comes to touch the handle herself, her own hand is dripping with the myrrh they put in. The next verse, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. Again, he came to the door to connect with her, and she wasn't there, so he left a little loving touch behind, and he patiently moved on. And just think about this in your own marriage. When expectations are not being met, are you responding kindly and gently? in such a way that you could draw the other person into you? I love this quote by Dr. David Jeremiah. He says this, isn't it interesting and even a little touching for Shulamith, that's the name of the woman, which we'll get to later in the series, to admit that her heart yearned for him to succeed in lifting a latch and coming inside. Despite her prideful resolve, she finds herself rooting for him to get through a door she's locked against him. She loves him. We know that she has yearned for him earlier in the evening. Why not just open the door and get what she wants? Perhaps there is an inner struggle within Shulamith. Have you ever willed yourself to be angry with someone even though what you really wanted deep in your heart was to put things right with them? Have you ever let pride become the boss of you? Now, I know this message isn't gonna hit for everybody right now. Some of you are in a really good, healthy season. Praise God, enjoy it. Someday, there might come another moment, someday. And when it comes, I want the wisdom of this moment to be kicking around in the back of your mind. 
Because when this is in the way, we have problems. You ever hear the phrase, pride comes before a fall? I, when I was young, early in my marriage, I do think part of what was happening that day, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I'm kind of over it because by the time you get to 47, you start to go, the time is short. I don't have time to sit around and hide things. I need to talk about them. So I'm just gonna tell you, I was immature in my marriage. I didn't know how to do marriage. I'm guessing my wife didn't either, but sometimes it feels like she was really so much better at this than I ever was. My knowledge about marriage came from three primary places. My mom and dad, who are still married to this day, I believe over 50 years, it's great, praise God. I learned a lot from them. The second thing though is I was in a lot of dating relationships in high school and college, and so what I learned about marriage was when things got hard, you break up and you move on. And then the third thing is, I actually learned a lot about relationships from TV and movies. And what I didn't know, and I know it sounds stupid to say, some of you are gonna laugh at this, but what I didn't know is that's a really bad place to get marital advice. Like you don't want your relationship to look like the one on TV. You know why? You know what the best marriage out there is? You know what the healthiest marriage is? Single or married people, everybody, this is gold, ready? It's the least dramatic one. That's the best marriage out there. But every book you ever read, every TV show you watch, every movie you watch, they are all built on drama. More and more drama because nobody wants to follow around a healthy marriage that's not interesting. Nobody wants to watch you not fight. Nobody wants to watch you pay your bills. Nobody wants to watch you eat dinner together and not really have anything new to say. Nobody wants to watch, but that's what a healthy marriage looks like. It looks drama free because there's great communication. There's great understanding. There's great planning. There's great strategy. Well, I didn't understand that. So when things were going sideways, I just would respond in dramatic ways and it made everything worse. It's not healthy. And I have this sneaky suspicion that some of you have been mentored by some of the same resources, except now you can add in Facebook or X or, or whatever, Snapchat, whatever you prefer to go to for social media. Years ago, a guy named uh, Egrich, Dr. Egrich, he wrote a book called Love and Respect. And in that book, he talks about something called the crazy cycle the crazy cycle. This is what the crazy cycle looks like. He's basing this off a passage in Ephesians chapter five. In Ephesians chapter five, it says that that husbands love your wives and wives respect your husbands. And his theory is most men, your love language is respect. That does not mean women don't want respect. But most women, your love language is love. That doesn't mean men don't want love. Okay, so he's not saying none of the other things are true, but he's saying the way that we interpret those things generally is women prefer love, men prefer respect. So what breaks down in marriages is when he feels disrespected, he reacts without love. When she feels unloved, she reacts without respect. And I didn't mean to start with her because I don't care who went first, it's irrelevant. He calls this the crazy cycle because basically we just keep doing this to each other. Fine, fine, you're gonna act like that, then I'm gonna act like this. And the reason it's called the crazy cycle is because we all, if we were to watch a TV show, you would sit there and go, these people are idiots. Like, if you were ever a fan of the show Friends, how many times did you think to yourself, aren't Ross and her ever just going to have a conversation about how they really feel? But see, that's boring. That doesn't get you 10 seasons. But in real life, if you want marriage to work, somebody has to be the one to jump out of the cycle. And this is the hardest thing you're ever gonna do. I'm not sitting up here trying to make it sound easy. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. What it's gonna take is it's gonna take her saying, even if he is not currently showing me love, I'm going to respect him with the intention and the goal that over time, he's going to change the way he acts because it's the right thing to do. Because Jesus says, do to others what you want them to do to you. But here's the thing, men, and I don't want you to miss this, right? I am convinced, and I know it's antiquated. I know people call me old school, but I am convinced that God has called men to be the leaders in our homes. And the way that I apply that in this situation is that means you have to go first. That means you have to be the one to say, I'm sorry first. Even though what's gonna go through your mind is, yeah, but I wouldn't have done that if she. I know, it doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant. If you want the crazy cycle to stop, let it stop with you. That means even if you continue to feel disrespected, and this isn't a, I'm gonna do it one time and see how it works. This is, I'm going to continue to love even when I feel disrespected. Because the adage is this, 
If I act the way I want to feel, I will eventually feel the way I act. Let that one sink in for a minute, because here's the thing. Feelings follow actions. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you feel a certain way about a certain thing, but then you have to go check how you feel and start to act differently because then your feelings will follow your actions. This is always true. Just a little side story for a minute. I remember when I was taught this principle by one of my friends and mentors, a guy uh, named Rick Sudsbury, and Rick taught me this. I remember one day I was sitting on the couch and I was really, really tired. My kids were playing and they were inviting me to get off the couch and play with them. But I had a really long and busy week and Rachel was more than willing to help with the kids. But I felt like the Holy Spirit, I felt like God told me, Matt, get off the couch. You will feel the way you act if you just get off the couch and get in motion. And I remember dragging my backside off the couch, not wanting to, kind of sliding to the floor, and then getting up and being like, okay, do this. I know you're tired. Just do it. We had so much fun in that moment because I didn't give in to the way I felt. I acted the way I knew I was supposed to act, and I have for, will forever have a memory in my head. They probably won't remember because they were three and five years old, but I will always have that memory in my mind that if I do what I'm supposed to do, my feelings will follow, and I laughed, and I didn't feel tired until later that night. Marriage is no different. Write the note, buy the flowers, be intimate, say I'm sorry, go on a date, even when you don't want to. Because your feelings will eventually follow your actions. Verse seven, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not. She's now going to start to feel resentment, and not resentment, sorry, regret. She's going to start to feel regret. Ah, oh, why didn't I do this sooner? And here's what I don't want for you. I don't want you to walk away from here wondering, why didn't I do something sooner? Why did I wait? Why did I wait till it was too late? Why didn't I just say, I'm sorry? So I told you there was one thing I'll never forget from that conference. This is the place I first learned it that was reinforced many times later in my life. And that was this roughly 23 years ago when Rachel and I went to the weekend to remember conference. I remember one of the, the couples who was talking in one of the seminars or whatever the sessions. I remember them talking about fighting. And they were talking about uh, how are you fighting and are you fighting to win? And here's what I remember because I don't know about you guys, but I really am competitive. Like I really, really, really like winning. Like I really like winning. And I remember, like just to give you an example, like when Rachel and I would play games in our marriage, uh, I'm okay with losing, kind of. I can make peace with losing as long as I finally win. So if we play a game and she wins, we have to play again. And if she wins again, we have to play again. And if she wins again, we have to play again. And we aren't allowed to stop till I win once. Now, I'm not the kind of person that's like, we gotta quit as soon as I win. We don't have to be those people. We can keep playing, but we can't quit until I win. Because that's just how it is. But see, play that out then in fighting. Let me ask you a question. In your relationship with your spouse or your significant other, if you win the fight, what happens to them? They lose. Now I want you to sink that in for a minute because what happens in a marriage where your spouse loses? So the question is, are we fighting with each other or are we fighting for each other? And there's a world of a difference. Am I fighting to win so that you lose, or am I fighting to fix the problem, restore health, and move forward? Next week, when we pick back up in Songs of Solomon, I'll try to give some really practical tips about how to make this work in marriage from the text and from what God's word says. But we have to start with this first. We have to start with the, what is the win? What is the goal at the end of this? The goal is for us to be one flesh again to be connected and restored and to remember that I love you and that we are on the same team and whatever problem we're facing, whether it's your bad decisions or your bad decisions or life that's happening around us and the chaos that comes, I am with you. I am for you. We want to win together. I committed to you for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. I'm in this to the very end. Yeah. 
And I love, I was at a conference years ago and a guy used this passage. And I know this passage isn't about this, but I really, really, really want you to catch this. There's a book called Nehemiah in the Bible. And the, the book is a guy named Nehemiah. He's living outside of Israel because the entire city has been destroyed. And he works for the king of this other nation. And God puts it in Nehemiah's heart to go back into the city and to rebuild the walls. And the king gives him money and resources and he takes the Israelite people and they go back and they start rebuilding the walls. Well, the other nations around Israel are scared that they're rebuilding the walls. So they start to raise up uh, little groups of people in armies because they're gonna come attack them, this group, and try to prevent them from rebuilding the walls. But see, if God is rebuilding something, nobody can stop it from happening, nobody and so Nehemiah is trying to get the people focused, but all these rumors are coming in. Oh, this group's coming in, and this group's coming in. They're going to stop, and they're going to do this. And Nehemiah is trying to remind the people. He's like, forget about them. Don't listen to the noise. And so finally, it says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your families, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, and fight for your homes. Fight! But don't fight with each other. Fight for each other. He goes on and he literally says, with a sword in one hand and the other hand at work, get back to it. They literally are rebuilding the walls with one hand on a sword just in case the enemy comes. And I love that analogy because you have an enemy and he's trying to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to chip away at the health and the vitality of your family and your marriage. Are you going to let him win? See, if you could see him, if you knew someone was at the door and beating down the door to come and attack your family, you'd grab your sword, you'd grab your gun, you'd be ready to stand your ground and defend them. But because you can't see the enemy, you don't interpret things the right way. You take it as something else, and then you start attacking each other. And it makes no sense. And I want to call you to something better. I want to call you, especially you men, to fight. Fight for your wives and your sons and your daughter and your children and your homes. Fight. If you need to repent, repent. If you need to say, I'm sorry, say, I'm sorry. If you need help, get help. But don't do nothing. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. Fight. Now, in just a moment, I'll come back up and I'm gonna finish Songs of Solomon. Which is one more last piece of nugget. But I don't want this moment to pass. I wanna I want ask God to come in and speak this moment. And here's what I'm gonna say real quick. If you were sitting with your spouse, um, I'm just going to ask you to put your arm around them, hold their hand, do something, draw them close. I've asked Chelsea to come and sing the song. This is not a worship song. This is not a praise God song. This is a, I want to call you to reconnect song. I want to call you back to each other song. So I just want to ask that God would speak this place because I don't know how this is going to land in here today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the ways that you're using this message already this morning in people's lives. God, would you break through in a very special, unique way through the power of the spirit right now? Would you draw husbands and wives, men and women back to each other this morning? that we would fight for each other in Jesus' name.